um, hello everybody. Um, but the Hedi has invited me to give you a sh short introduction into geothermal energy. And um, now I opened the wrong file to begin with, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so uh, this series, this lecture will be uh, actually two lectures, but there's different parts. The first lecture that I will start is an overview. And that overview will say something about where geothermal energy is being used, how important it is in the total mix of energies that we consume. And uh, after that, we move to the geological background to geothermal energy. How come there is energy in the world that we can use, or in the earth, I should say, maybe. And then we will also look at where in Egypt could you try to do a geothermal project. After that, we switch to the technologies that are being used to harvest the energy that is present in the Earth. So, that is what uh, the program is like. And uh, so the first question is, what is geothermal energy? And uh, when we were still online, there was one young lady who said, um, a young man who said um, what it is, it is the heat that we have in the earth and we take that heat to produce either electricity or if it comes out as warm water, we can use that warm water, for example, for heating a building or a swimming pool. So that is, um, that is the basis of it. Now, in principle, you the energy is present everywhere on Earth, whether you are on the land, whether you are in the mountain or in the valley, or whether you are even on the sea. Everywhere where you go down, when you drill a well into the Earth, it will become warmer and warmer, and therefore there is heat stored everywhere. Now the problem is that we cannot harvest that everywhere at an economic cost. And we will look at why that is. Those reasons are mostly geological. So the economic usage of geothermal energy is only at the moment there in very limited areas. And at least when you talk about electricity generation. For electricity generation, we have to be in areas where the energy content, the total enthalpy, or the energy content of the area is very high. And we will see what that means. We'll see what is, why an area has a high enthalpy and why an area has a low enthalpy. So when that is high, then you can think about direct electricity generation. And there's only very limited areas in the world where we can do that. The, is, there's more possibilities to use the heat in the Earth in low and medium enthalpy areas because there's more areas like that. But then to make electricity is very, very difficult or impossible. And then finally there is a totally different usage of the Earth. is when you use the Earth to store heat and then take it out again. So you use it as an energy storage system. So not as an energy source, but an energy storage. But we still call it geothermal energy. And as you'll see, the biggest growth is particularly in that area. So, the geothermal power is there. We know where it is. And we even know how to get the energy out. The technology is there, we know it, we call, it, we call this a mature energy. In principle, you only have to drill a well, let the steam come out, or the hot water, and harvest that and drive the steam through a steam turbine and generate electricity. All these technologies are very well known, and we don't have to invent anything new. So, so that's good. Now, how much do we have of that? You would think if it's that so easy, we would have an awful lot. No, it's very modest so far. Even though the growth is good, 
by 3% or 4% every year, we still have a fairly low amount of installed power. At the moment, so you see 2016, that was 13.4 gigawatts, and now it is about 14.6, and we will compare that to the power installed in Egypt in a few moments. Now, if you compare that 14 gigawatts to what we produce in energy in total in the world, it is an extremely small percentage. It's only 0.5% less than 1%. And in the US, if you look only at the US, and we look at only at renewables, of the, in the renewable energy mix, so therefore our winds and photovoltaics and hydropower, then compared to that, it's only 5% of all the renewables is coming from geothermal energy. So it is a very small player in the energy field. But there's one enormous advantage of geothermal energy over photovoltaics and wind. As you all know, photovoltaics, it only works when the sun is up. So in the night, no electricity from photovoltaics. If you look at wind, when the wind stops blowing, you have no energy. And therefore, it is complicated for power companies to integrate that power into their network. Now, the good thing about geothermal power is that it has a 100% load factor. It's always there. Once you have installed the power plant, it will always work, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, unless it breaks down. So even though it's a small source, it has a very big advantage over the traditional renewable energy sources. So let's look at this graph. The graph shows you the world geothermal energy over time, so it starts around 1975, the curve, and it ends in 2019. And uh, these are data from the statistical annual review for energy that the uh, German company BP makes every year. It's a very nice source for of, uh, data if you have to look up something. So you just go to BP statistical annual review, and then you and find these sort of data that make the ground. Now, what do we have? Vertical axis, gigawatt installed. And it goes to 16 gigawatt. So that's, of course, not so much. And then we have the timeline from 1970 to 2020. We see the curve steadily going up. And also indicated is, so today we have about 14 gigawatt installed. Well, how much gigawatt installed energy in Egypt? 55, only Egypt. And this geothermal is for the whole world. Now, how much energy is, that is the world installed energy? 3000 gigawatt. So you see, it's only a very small fraction, half a percent is due to geothermal. <coughs> so, but still, um, it's worthwhile looking at it because it is a extremely clean source of energy. It has much less environmental problems than photovoltaics, for example, because photovoltaics you have to do a lot of dirty mining and there's negative elements related to photovoltaics. Geothermal doesn't have that. It's probably one of the next to hydropower, it's the cleanest energy that we know of. But you need specific geological settings, and that is where the problem comes in, and that is what we will talk about after this introduction, short introduction. And there's only a few countries where it really works well. If you go to Iceland, Iceland is, a, the word says it, it's a very cold country, it's an island in the middle of the Atlantic, and 80% of all their energy used comes from geothermal. So the 20% of course is for transportation, so that is fossil fuels. But the rest is actually all geothermal. The Philippines, 60% of installed power is geothermal. Kenya, we all know Kenya, it's quite close by, about 40% of 
of installed power is geothermal. And then, for example, New Zealand is then 20%. And in Egypt, zero. At the moment, it is zero. So here's a map of the so-called high enthalpy geothermal energy operations, and that is electricity from steam that comes straight out of the earth and is fed into a steam turbine. And you see there is red dots, and where are they? The western part of the US, nothing in the east. It is a lot in Japan, a lot of red dots. I mean, you see the red dots in Iceland, so Iceland is here. And then uh, look at New Zealand here all the way in the south. So, and Indonesia. Indonesia has a large amount of installed power and the Philippines are. So let's, so, so let's see why is it? Why is it there and not, let's say, in the middle of Africa? So I asked you the question, what is enthalpy? And the answer is enthalpy is a thermodynamic quantity equivalent to the total heat content of the system. It is equal to the internal energy of the system plus the product of pressure and volume. That is the thermodynamic definition. As this young lady, I guess you were, Juman, uh, said when we were still trying to do this online. Now, so why are the red dots where they are? Why are these places high entropy places? It is related to volcanism. And this is a picture of a volcano in Kenya. The red stuff is molten rock. That molten rock has a temperature of more than 1,000 degrees centigrade. So it is super high enthalpy content. And so in those places where we have volcanic activity now or in the not too distant past, geologically spoken, you will have high enthalpy areas. So um, this is a statistical overview of where this geothermal energy is found. You see that the US is about a quarter of the installed energy capacity, the Philippines and, and Indonesia together for the other quarter, and then there is, let's say, another two handfuls of uh, countries like Iceland, Japan, New Zealand, Italy, Mexico. I think the oldest geothermal plant in the world already from more than 100 years old is in Italy. So it's a, a very old form of energy. And actually, if you talk about geothermal energy in Egypt, you should say that the oldest geothermal energy usage was in Egypt because the Pharaonic people had already their hot baths from in uh, places like uh, Hammam, Hauran, where they had hot baths by natural energy. So, yes, it is a well-known source of energy, and Egypt has used it from pharaonic times, but in a, not for electricity, of course. So this is Iceland. Look, it's all snow-covered. It's a beautiful country, but it's bloody cold. You see the steam coming out of the earth, and this is a steam power plant, like they have quite a number in Iceland that drives all the electricity generation. So if you look in Iceland, what do they use all this energy for? About 37% for electricity generation. The other half, 50%, 48%, is just heating buildings. So you have warm water and it's cold. You just have hot water in piping systems that goes to every house in Iceland. They have a, a network of pipelines that nicely insulated pipelines that heat all the buildings in the country. So just like we have a gas infrastructure pipelines or electricity infrastructure network, they have also a pipeline system for hot water. So, and then the rest is housed, used for a bit of greenhouses and industry and uh, the snow melting is interesting. They make the drinking water from snow and melting it with geothermal energy. And here we see the development of you know, the growth in geothermal energy in the world in a graphical way. There's two axes. On the right hand axis, you see world geothermal capacity in, in megawatts. And you see it goes up from uh, 
from uh, what is it about 6,000 megawatts in 1990 to 14,000 megawatts or 14 gigawatt nowadays. And you also see the percentage increase of the power. And what we see is that even though, yes, geothermal energy increases quite well, 3.4% per year, its share in the energy mix does not increase, simply because other energy sources also increase in volume. So it's about a stable 0.5% uh, of the energy mix that we have. And here we can see it again, development over time. And what the reason I show this again is I want to show you that there's one source of geothermal energy that grows massively in terms of share, and that is essentially for low entropy energy. The high entropy energy, so related to volcanoes and so on, does not grow that much. It does grow, but not by a massive amount. Where the big growth is, is the usage of the earth to use it as an energy buffer. In other words, you create hot water, you pump it into the ground, and you keep it there, and then in the winter time, you can harvest that and heat your house. You make the hot water in summertime. And in Egypt, we could use that if we want to. So, so what do we do for, uh, for application is if we have very high entropy, very high heat in the, in the surface. We make dry steam and we make electricity right away. Then if it's a bit half-half, we can still use the, the hot water and flash it to steam and make either and make a low efficiency electricity. And then we have um, uh, the other one is enhanced geothermal systems. Then we have to go very deep and we have to frack rocks, we have to break the rocks, pump in water and uh, harvest the heat of water back. But we we'll come to that in the next lecture. And then direct use of heat, so not for electricity, it's for using hot water for heating buildings or drying uh, bananas or, uh, or for this uh, ground source heat pump application that we will talk about later. So that is the introduction to the geothermal energy. I must say, I don't know how I'm doing in time. I have not looked uh, at that. So, um, now I want to say something about the geological background, because otherwise it stays floating in the air. Why is geothermal energy working in Iceland and not in Egypt so well, if you wish? This is a slice from the earth. Like if you would take an apple and you cut out a part right to the core of the apple, then you would see the skin, and then you would see the flesh of the apple, and then you see the core of the apple where the seeds are. Well, this is exactly like you can see it in the earth. You have the skin, which is the crust, and then you have the the part which we call the mantle, and that's compared to the flesh of the apple that you eat. And then the core, this very hot core, is uh, compared to where the seeds in the apple are. Now this core is extremely hot. It's about 6,000 degrees centigrade. It's also 6,700 kilometers deep into the earth. But it is our heat pump. It's a massive, massive heat pump that drives everything that happens on Earth. Whether it's earthquakes or volcanoes or a heat coming out or whatever you have, it is driven by this heat pump. It's, uh, we will not go into the details, of course, since this is not a uh, course in geology. What you see, in a point, a point on the screen here, in blue is the ocean water. Here in green we have a mountain range on the continent. So this would be land here. And it says, this red arrow says high heat flow. So this is a high entropy area. The plumes coming out here are volcanoes. Now why do we have volcanoes here? Because this skin of the earth, which we call the crust, dives here under an, oh, another part of the of the crust, so under the continent, and this 
crust melts, it makes very hot rock and it goes up and it comes out like molten rock lava in a volcano, as I showed you on the picture from Canada. That causes this focused heat. Then also there's other places like in the middle of the ocean, but I will not go into that detail. Now, if we now look at the map of the Earth again, like we did when we looked at what are high entropy areas, and you remember the red dots in Kenya and in Japan and in Italy and in Iceland and in the Philippines. Um, see that the word Philippines is mispositioned. I'm going to reposition it right now. Oh, I cannot do that. Let me see. Are here. Okay. Sorry about that. So, so we see that these volcanic areas are related to where we know they are from the news. Eh? Japan has many volcanoes and volcanic ex explosions. Just like Indonesia, we all know that Indonesia has volcanoes, we know from Iceland. Maybe we do not know it from Northern Ireland and New Zealand, but okay. Um, and the Western US, uh, one of the biggest uh, disasters in the 70s was an explosion in the, in the Rocky Mountains and it wiped out uh, many, many things. But um, volcanoes are, are linked to these mountain ranges that are overlying where the crust of the ocean goes underneath the continent. And then in Kenya it's a bit different and also in the Red Sea it's a big difference. So let me just go there. So we have a blow up here of Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Djibouti, the map of Mandap here of the Red Sea, and then the Red Sea northern up to where Egypt is. You see a lot of volcanic triangles, and it is because the continent breaks in apart. So you have to realize that the Red Sea was not there 20 million years ago. That's a long time. Ago. 20 million years ago, the Red Sea did not exist. But Arabia broke off from Africa, and also in those cases, volcanoes started to erupt. The volcanoes that we know from Egypt are all related to that activity. Present day, part of Eastern Africa is breaking off from Africa, and that is why we have these volcanoes there. So, but uh, the message is that yes, we have areas with volcanic activity, and that is where we should focus our search for energy for direct electricity generation. Now, how come the, the, the Earth is so warm in there? We, see, we saw the heat pump, but how do we compute something? It is related to an energy unit that we call heat flow. And heat flow is the amount of watts per square meter. So now you're getting closer to Energy lectures by Dr. Hedy, we talk about watts. We don't talk about rocks, but we talk about watts. So, a watt per square meter. So, you see the Q in watt per square meter is related by a certain constant called the thermal conductivity of the rocks to what we call the geothermal gradient, which is the change in temperature with depth. Now, seeing this, I I am going to ask you separately, what would be the units for this thermal conductivity? You should be able to compute that now. But we will not do that now. So, now the heat flow needed, so that's Q, to make direct economic electricity is 200 milliwatts per square meter. That number says nothing for you. Unless, until I put it into context with what is the normal heat flow in the Earth? And that is what we see here. We see here a statistical overview of heat flow. That is the horizontal axis. And the number of occurrences, so the frequency. And you see oceans are the dark gray colors here, and continents are here. But all in all, the average heat flow on the Earth is 0 0.06 watts per square meter, or 60 milliwatts per square meter. In, in Egypt, it's roughly that, about 55 milliwatts per square meter. Now, how much is the heat flow coming from the sun to Earth? 
I have a 30 watt per square meter. I wasn't sure where it is, but I put it here. 30 watt per square meter. So that is almost 2,000 times. It's a massive higher. In Egypt, it is even 400 watt per square meter. Yeah? So you would say, God, this energy from the earth is so little. But of course, a lot of the sun heat is reflected, and so you cannot lose everything. And also, of course, the heat flow is there 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. It never ever stops. And the sun does not always shine. And in certain areas of the world, the sun is not as intensive as in other areas. So if you have an area with very high heat flow and low solar energy, you may be in business. And that happens in Iceland. So, uh, there is areas where it does work. That's the message. Now, here you see a, a, a plot of depth versus temperature. Now, let's go back to this formula. Put the formula. So, we have the heat flow is related to the ratio temperature change with depth. So, if you make a plot of depth versus temperature, we should get straight lines, right? It's the, it is the, the tangent or the angle of a line on that plot. And that is what you see here. You see on this plot different solid black lines, and they are heat flow lines, constant heat flow lines. So the, the one that goes, uh, increases uh, a little bit of temperature with depth, has of course a low heat flow. If you increase temperature very fast with that, you have a higher heat flow. And in colors, you see where do you apply certain types of geothermal energy. So when the color is red, we are in the high heat flow domain, so the high enthalpy domain, and we can do direct electricity generation from heat flow. On the other hand, if we have a low heat flow area, which is fairly normal, we saw that Egypt has 55 milliwatts per square meter. So the, the heat flow curve for Egypt would run roughly like this. Then there, it is very hard to make direct electricity in the normal, in most of the places in Egypt. But as we'll see, there is a few places in Egypt where we can apply. There is a Question here on the slide. This is going to be your homework. I will not discuss it here. And uh, so I just ask you what type of um, development, geothermal development, would you do if you have a certain restriction to the drilling capacity of your, um, of your company? So I will, set, I will upload that question in a proper um, assignment for you. Now, here is a, uh, again a cut into the earth. You have to see this is depth. So you slice with your knife, you make a big cut into the earth. You live here at surface. That is where your well is and where the rain falls. And this layer here, this gray layer, which we call an aquifer, is filled with rainwater from the top. That layer goes to greater depth, therefore it gets warmer. We saw with depth the temperature increased. So the water in the aquifer becomes hotter and hotter. And if you have then a good heat pump here at depth, this water becomes warm enough to form steam. And so in this high area, there will be a steam cap overlying your hot water. You drill a well into that steam volume and you have a direct steam source for your electrical energy generation. Nature could let that escape by a fracture or fault and breaking area in the rocks above, and then you get a fumarole, as they call it. And if you do at the edge between steam and water, you get a geyser. And I'll show you two pictures of what they look like. So a geyser is hot water and steam, which you, which you can find. Uh, and then you have a fumarole, which is steam straight from the air, from the earth. So this you can use both actually for electricity generation. This, the fumarole would be for direct 
question. The direct uh, electricity generation because of steam. The steam and water, you would have to separate the water pump from the steam before we bring the steam to the turbine, as we'll see later. So, where do we do this in Egypt? Where do you want to go? Where in Egypt would you have this high enthalpy area? I showed you the map, and, uh, but maybe you know just from going there that there is certain areas where there is natural hot springs. And the hot springs, of course, the most famous one is the Hamam Khawran uh, near uh, Rasidah in, uh, in the, the Gulf of Suez. And there's a few, quite a few hot springs there. Uh, and uh, they are amongst the best indications of a high enthalpy area in Egypt. There is more hot springs, but they're more isolated, like in Bahriya, there is one, uh, it's only 34 degrees, so that's not that hot. Hamam uh, Fawran is 70 degrees. That really is a hot spring, and it, and it stimulates the mind to think about geothermal energy when you see them. And then also the other oasis often do have some one or two hot springs still active. Now, um, the green blocks are all oil wells, so, so don't be good for, for hydrocarbons, so so not, let's not focus on that. The blue, uh, the blue dots are all water wells, and the red dots are your uh, uh, hot springs. But the best hot springs are around the highest temperatures we find around the Swiss map. I'm going to skip this now. So this is a image of the Earth. It's a radar image, it doesn't really matter. You see the mount, so this is the Red Sea here, the outline for the Red Sea. You see Gulf of Suez, Gulf of Aqaba, so Sharm al Sheikh is right here, near in, in this uh, yellow circle. And you see, so the, uh, you see the, the Oman Mountains and the uh, Arabian Gulf here. Now, the bar on top gives you the heat flow and in milliwatts per square meter. And as we saw, we need something like more than 150 milliwatts per square meter to do electricity generation. And those are the warm colors. So where do we see warm colors? In the red center of the Red Sea and particular at the tip just where Sharm al Sheikh sits and uh, where the, uh, let's say, on the border between Saudi and Egypt, and where the Red Sea splits into the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. That is a really uh, hot area from the point of view of geothermal energy. They have not indicated this along the Gulf of Suez. I must say, I'm not sure why not, because I'm pretty sure. The heat flow near Hamam um, uh, Fauran would be in the order of 100 milliwatts uh, at least. So it should have some green colors. Now, so uh, where do we have to go to do direct electricity generation? Drill a well in the Red Sea of Hurghada. Now, who is Hurghada south of Sharm uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. You go to Organa, you hire a drilling rig, you go, let's say, five kilometers offshore and you start drilling, and you will definitely be able to generate electricity. Where it's economic is another matter. But that is where you should go. And uh, so if I look, this is a cross section through the Gulf of, uh, of, the, the, the Gulf of Swiss, the Sinai here, and the hot springs for the Hamam Oran would be roughly here. And so it is because there is faults like this, and that's where the steam from uh, the hot water comes out. And so you could drill here in the middle of the Gulf of Suez, you could even drill a well and go to this deeper layer and find hot enough water to start generating steam. That is my prediction that that is possible, but it needs more study. So, Dr. Perry, why don't you? Initiate a wonderful study. I will soon. I was able to see. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, capping it up for Egypt. Uh, which geothermal energy options in Egypt? 
So you see in the red part, I put in so between 150 and 300 milliwatts per square meter in this uh, depth temperature block. I put in a big block red C question mark. And then the big yellow area is the general standard geothermal conditions for Egypt. And only in a few places you could be maybe do something with getting hot water. But you would have to drill quite deep. And let's see. If you would like to have in most of the area in Egypt, you would like to have water of 100 degrees centigrade, then you have to drill at least a three kilometers depth. And that will, well, will probably cost you $20 million. So that uh, gives big problems, you can say. So we have to be close to the Red Sea, as far as I'm concerned. And there was a big study done by, um, no. I apologize that I did not put the reference on the slide. I will put before I upload it. It's uh, by a bunch of uh, Egyptian scientists. They have made this, they worked on geothermal energy for quite a number of years. And this is they did from their latest paper in 2018. And this map puts together a lot of different data types. And the map shows the, let's say, the favorability of how good is it to do geothermal energy. And you see it's all red near Wadi, um, so uh, Hamam Oran and uh, Sharm el Sheikh, and in the southern part of the Gulf of Suez. Off Rugada, you are in business if you wish. So that would be a very good, let's say, study to do, and you would have to work together with people who know things about geothermal energy. But the first screening would be costing such a project. So that is um, uh, essentially all the conclusions you can uh, read uh, on the screen later. I will stop here for this part of the lecture. And normally I would, I would like to ask you questions, but after this comes a short story on the main technology. So what we do do this, uh, Dr. Hedy? Okay. Okay, so this is a break here for five minutes for you, or not. I will upload the other file and uh, continue. You don't want to make it two separate videos. No. So I'll, I will continue with the technology. And that's only 16 slides, so it's pretty brief. Um, so, now. Um, as said already before, we have two types of applications. is the high enthalpy, lots of heat per cubic meter, and not at too great depth. And so there we can get dry steam and for direct uh, energy generation, or flash steam for a bit more complicated electricity generation. Or we drill very deep into hot rocks, and we break the rocks, pump in water, and make steam artificially. And then non-direct use, so that's for low entropy, and we just use the heat in other ways to heat buildings or dry fruits and vegetables or these type of applications. Anywhere where industry needs hot water for the process. So instead of making hot water with fossil fuel, you make hot water by a heat exchanger with um, uh, geothermal energy. Now, so here is what they call a mind map. The mind map separates the field, it, it connects a central question or issue to um, things that are or processes or data types or observations that link to that central idea. So the central idea here is geothermal energy. And as you see, I have divided the area into four quadrants. The top half says there is no water, we have to inject water into Mother Earth to make, to make hot water, so we inject cold water and get, get the hot water back. And the bottom half, we say no, the water is already there, and we produce that hot water for energy applications. Now the left hand side of the diagram is about a high entropy domain, which you now know what, what that means. And the right hand side is this low entropy domain. And so um, let's let's look at the various ones. Let's first look at the best 
opportunities in terms of making energy. That is on the bottom right hand quadrant. Quadr quadr so there we have water in place. So we have we have what we call in situ water. The water is there in situ means in place. So we have water present in Mother Earth. It is there, and it's a high temperature at a reasonably low depth. So we don't have to drill very deep to get to that of water. So we produce a dry steam from which we can make uh, power. We generate power, and if it's very high heat flow, uh, then uh, then that area is you know very widespread. If we only can look at vol really volcanoes, we have to be in very limited areas in the world. So, but it's just generally high heat flow areas. For example, here in the southern Gulf of Suez or near Charmancier, or we have to go to an active volcano, which we do not have in Egypt. Now, if you low, look um, uh, also for the high entropy domain, but where there is no water, we have to inject water, then we talk about this enhanced geothermal systems, where we have to drill deep, and deep is very deep, so we could do that, for example, in Aswan, and we drill into the granites, and we drill that very deep, and, uh, and we, then we pump in water on a very high pressure. We get a pressure, a break in the water, and we pump in that water, and that water will heat up and come back as steam. You can do this anywhere in Egypt, but it's going to be expensive. So there's certain areas where it's a bit less deep, they require drilling, but uh, it will, it's the most expensive option that you have. But when you come to become desperate or very smart, maybe it can still be made. And then we have this low entropy domain. So on the right hand side, the bottom, there is water there. But it is not that hot. So you would have to drill very deep to get to very hot water. But if you drill, let's say, to two kilometers depth, you would have hot water, but, and hot would be 100 degrees centigrade or 150 degrees centigrade. Then either you then do a certain trick, you can make a fresh steam power plant, and we'll look at technical logical options, and, uh, and then you can still create electricity. Um, or you drill very deep, like your five kilometers, and then you can go many places, also in Egypt, and you can still do energy, electricity generation. And then in the upper right, it is just hot water, so that is not making for electricity, but it's for heat. You use the heat to have a warm swimming pool, or dry your fruits and vegetables, or use it in an industrial process where you need warm water. And then finally, you can store that hot water very shallow. You, you, you can use the storage of the earth that you generate hot water by solar energy during the day. You pump it underground. And you do that during the whole summer, and you have a large volume of hot water which you can use in the winter to heat your homes. That can be done in Egypt, of course. I don't know how efficient it is. That is that to be found out. Okay, so that is the overview. And here you see a plot of depth into the earth, up to six kilometers. And then on the horizontal axis are different sort of systems depicted. So shallow wells is just use the earth as storage for hot water and production of hot water. And with the, or you can, um, in the cold climate, uh, you do something different. You look at that, it's called the uh, ground heat source um, pump, uh, ground source heat pumps. Then we have what we call hydrothermal systems. So we drill for two kilometers. The water is nice and hot, up to 100, 120 degrees. You can, uh, you can do something with that in terms of energy processes. Then we drill a bit deeper to four and a half, five kilometers. We have hot water aquifers, and we can use that for, let's say, lower efficiency electricity generation, flash heating, or using the uh, dual system, as I will show you. And then finally, Hot dry rocks that are very deep, uh, where you want to pressure it off. So that would be 
for normal domains of children. You see the high entropy is not really indicated, that will happen at the first one to two kilometers and there are high heat flow and we discussed that already separately. Now, so let's say you have steam coming out of the sub subsurface. You drill to 1500 meters, it's not an expensive well, and alhamdulillah it produces steam directly. Steam comes up, you feed it into a turbine, the turbine drives a generator and that makes electricity. Steam cools a bit, but you inject it back into the earth. It will still be quite hot. Yeah? But it's a bit stupid to do that. You better use that hot water. And what is depicted in this picture, so it's the same dry steam electricity power plant, but now it's a bit smarter in design. So the steam comes up the pipe, drives the turbine, the turbine drives the generator for electricity, and then the colder, bit colder steam comes out, which uh, there is a uh, heat exchanger, a cooling system, but the hot water coming there you can use for directly pump it to a, let's say, an industry or a household that needs hot water. And then the wastewater you pump back into the earth. Applicable in a few places only in Egypt, so as I said, as long as you're close to Purgada, you're fine. Uh, efficiency is high and the costs are, I think, medium. But that is something that has to be engineered. Now we go to a bit less favorable, so the uh, entropy is a little bit lower, but still high enough to produce hot water. And the water is so hot that if you reduce the pressure, it will start to boil and you get steam in a system, so you have a flash tank, as they call it. And the flash tank is, of course, not as efficient as you have 100% steam, only part of your fluid becomes steam, so the efficiency is lower. But the pressure drop in the flash tank creates steam that can drive your turbine and your generator. And again, if you do that in a smart way, then the turbine, uh, uh, so there is a flash, flash point where you separate the brine from the steam, the steam drives the turbine, and the hot waste water can be used for direct, direct heat use in industry or in households. Efficiency is, uh, you can use that in more areas in Egypt, so it's a bit wider in application range than the real uh, dry steam. Um, then uh, efficiency is medium, and I, I'm not sure about the cost medium, I say that, but it has to be engineered. And it is, it's a relative term. What is a low cost of this re that relates to how much does it cost to do with fossil fuel or with photovoltaics? Now, if the water is not so hot, and you cannot make really proper steam, then there is what they call a dual cycle setup possible. So, what you do is, um, that is a, called a Kalina cycle. So, you have to realize that not all fluids become steam at the same time temperature. Water becomes steam above 100 degrees centigrade, but the critical point for water where you only have steam, not steam and hot water, is over, of course, uh, uh, let's say 200, or the critical point is 375 degrees centigrade, but I think if you're over 200, you're already very safe. But if you take an organic fluid, like butane or pentane, that boils at 60 degrees centigrade. So we could make steam out of butane liquid by in a heat exchanger with hot water at 100 degrees centigrade. And that is called the Kalina cycle. So you pump up hot water in a medium enthalpy area. You bring that to the heat exchanger here in green, and that hot water will make steam out of butane or another organic liquid that boils at a lower temperature. And that is a very good possibility to consider 
if you live in an area with not super high envelope uh, areas. And here is again another uh, picture of it. So hot water comes out, heat exchange of heat and red, it boils the isobutane in this case, and uh, that makes isobutane vapor, it drives the tur turbine, the turbine drives the generator, which makes electricity. The butane cools uh, by the condenser, and then you bring it back to the heat exchanger in a full cycle to uh, make isobutane vapor again. So you have a water cycle and an organic liquid cycle, and that is why they call it a dual cycle, and it's a Kalina like system. Um, the problem is that the efficiency goes down. But okay, again, it has to be cost engineered to find out what you need. All right, and then I think I come to uh, the last thing, which is the uh, which is using the ground source heat pump, and it's very popular in colder climate. What do they do um, in the winter? They take uh, I should start in the summer. In the summer, they make hot water, for example, with photovoltaics. They store that into the earth. In the winter, they produce that hot water to heat their homes. Oh, this, this one. So they take hot water, they heat it up, and it brings it to the earth, and they store it there, it becomes warm, and then in the, they, they produce that hot water in the winter to make to heat the, the, um, the homes. In the summer, they create hot water, and they store it into the earth and pump it uh, up in. And they pump up cold water in the summer from the earth to cool their houses. It's called a ground uh, source heat pump system, and it's particularly popular in countries in Northern Europe, where many, many new development houses are never going to use gas heated systems anymore. They use this electric system. And I know for a fact my brother in law just installed it a few years ago, so it works. It works, but you need electricity to. Drive the heat pump, but that is what you could do with solar energy. So, I think this is um, uh, almost all. It's done but last slide. So, here we have a little bit of cost high entropy electricity. This is from the internet, I have not computed this myself. About five dollar cents per kilowatt hour. And Dr. Hardy tells me that is cheap. Initial investment about two and a half million dollars per megawatt installed. Or one billion for one gigawatt, and the operational costs are very low because you don't have any energy usage costs, so you don't have to buy energy to make electricity. It says scaling problems. It's a subject we want to discuss, but most of the water that you produce have a lot of dissolved salts and they precipitate in your pipes and you have to clean them. That is your main headache that you wish. But okay, that's not part of the course. You would have to take a new course in geothermal energy. If you go to low entropy, so we have heat, heat and cooling cycles, only four cents per kilowatt hour. It's very good for just simple warming in the building, really good. Um, so and I understand this is really competitive to regular grid cost, at least in the country where I come from in Northern Europe. Investment costs there are about uh, yeah. lower than for a uh, high entropy heat plant. Mm -hmm. It's about fifteen hundred hundred dollars per kilowatt hour installed. Uh, it's typical, very typical for distributed energy. You do this for homes, and so you don't, you, you're not, you can, you can go off grid if you wish. So that is very attractive, and then it becomes, it becomes much easier to cover your energy requirement with solar energy if you don't have to worry about heating the wood. So, uh, and it's fast, very low maintenance and operational cost. So it, it is a very attractive option, but here in Egypt, I'm not sure how it would work. It, again, it has to be this stuff. So, all in all, uh, for Egypt, um, um, uh, there is some possibilities to do dry steam uh, or fresh steam uh, or Kalina cycle electricity generation. It's some, as long as you approach to the Red Sea, it should, it should be possible. And then for direct, uh, direct uh, heat, 
the application ranges are a bit wider. You can use it to make a spa and make a good business out of it. And uh, if you have hot baths, and you can use it to heat your uh, greenhouses in the winter or that sort of thing. Um, as long as your water temperature in the aquifer is between 100 and 200 degrees centigrade, in other words, you have, you have to drill maybe two kilometers, that you are in business. So, um, I think this is all I want to say for the heading. And what will happen now is um, this has been video recorded, so you can study it at your leisure. I will up upload. The files that I have discussed on uh, Moodle, and I will upload uh, an assignment for you to do, which will be part of the grade of this course. And that is all. I thank you for your attention, and I hope uh, you um, have enjoyed the lecture. And if there's any questions, fire up the Patty, you will be able to find me.